please be seated. Welcome. Thank you for joining us on this wondrous occasion. When founding President William Rainey Harper and John D. Rockefeller established the University of Chicago, they embarked on a radical experiment. An experiment predicated on a belief that higher learning should be marked by research, not recitation, extension, not insularity. Central to this experiment was a commitment to lifelong learning, an effort to specifically reach, and I quote, those who lived beyond campus and did not fall into established categories of students, end quote. This experiment soon became a model of the 20th century university, as the forces of urbanization, globalization, and technology accelerated the adoption of the University of Chicago's novel approach. With this convocation, we conclude the university's 125th anniversary, and we celebrate your achievements as the natural continuation of that experiment, which started a quarter century and a century ago. Your effort, dedication, and commitment to advancing your knowledge and your capabilities embody this university's founding values. At the same time, the exact forces that drove the creation of the 20th century university are driving the evolution of higher education today. This, along with the ongoing redefinition of what it means to be a student and an alum, suggests that not only are we celebrating today with an eye towards the past, we also are celebrating today with a very specific eye towards the future. Your accomplishments reflect not only our core founding values, but both Graham's and the University of Chicago's commitment to be a model of the 21st century university. So, on behalf of the instructors and administration at the Graham School, as well as those gathered here, family and friends, our most heartfelt congratulations. It's our hope that you will consider the University of Chicago not as a moment of study, but rather as your intellectual destination, your academic home, now and for many years to come. Again, congratulations. We will now present candidates for the degrees Master of Liberal Arts, Master of Science in Analytics, Master of Science in Threat and Response Management, and Master of Arts in Teaching. It is my honor to present these students who have completed the program of studies prescribed by the faculty of the William B. and Catherine V. Graham School of Continuing Liberal and Professional Studies. They have been awarded the degree Master of Liberal Arts by the Board of Trustees. Will the recipients of the degree Master of Liberal Arts please rise and proceed to the stage to receive your degree. Francine McKenna. John K. Nelson. <laughs> Catherine Schmidt. Stouffer. Brand 
Brendan Lee Stewart. Michael Landers. Emily Kieber Goldrick. Jose Samuel Stanley Paul Clare. Dimitri Don Allman. Ling Ling Zhu. It is my distinct honor to present these students who have completed the program of studies prescribed by the faculty of the William B. and Catherine V. Graham School of Continuing Liberal and Professional Studies. They have been awarded the degree of Master of Science and Analytics by the Board of Trustees. Will the recipients of the degree Master of Science and Analytics please rise and proceed to the stage to receive your degree. Kayvon Sean Ali. Bezidic. Leon Blackshaw. Jonathan Chan. <laughs> Ryan Dale Durfee. Armand. Ashcon Farmand. David Lawrence Galinsky. <laughs> Jennifer Katahira. Jade Mestag. <laughs> Ryan Pastrovich.
Venu Raghavan. Brian Ritz. Lawrence Salud. Kevil Shaw. Swarnim Shekhar. Jagjinder Singh. Julie Fay. Isabella Velasquez. <laughs> Anne Thien Vo. It is also my great honor to present these students who have completed the program of studies prescribed by the faculty of the William B. and Catherine V. Graham School of Continuing Liberal and Professional Studies. They have been awarded the degree of Master of Science in Threat and Response Management by the Board of Trustees. Will the recipients of the degree of Master of Science in Threat and Response Management please rise and proceed to receive your degree. David Bungi. <laughs> Anthony Butler. Jody Canaday. <laughs> Joseph Coglin. Linda Dyer.
Benjamin Dwyer. Sean Edmondson. Morris Guerin. Mary Catherine Horan. Jack Kilheffer. Jamie Lemon. Boris Levin. Winton Parker. Jody Pradelski. Martin Santoya. <laughs> Timothy Schnorr. Catherine Schloniker. <laughs> Matthew Swain. Emily Zarin. It is my honor to present these students who have completed the program of studies prescribed by the faculty of the William B. and Catherine V. Graham School of Continuing Liberal and Professional Studies. They have been awarded the degree Master of Arts in Teaching by the Board of Trustees. Will the recipients of the degree Master of Arts in Teaching please rise and proceed to the stage to receive your degrees. Luis Amaya.
Stephanie Arce. Molly Benison. Sky Black. Sally Castro. <laughs> Nathaniel Cha. Miriam Sun Young Che. <laughs> Whitney Taisha Coble. Matthew Patrick Collins. <laughs> Luvina Davis. Melissa Angela Georgiou. <laughs> Yolanda Herrera. John Idlis. <laughs> Jasmine Sharice Jefferson. Leslie Yuri Kang. <laughs> Marley Turner Kleinman. Mark Anthony Martinez. <laughs> Joseph Adam O'Hara.
Jordash Oliver. Jonathan Perez. <laughs> Elaine Svatos. Samantha Louise Simon. Oh. Rachel Erica Tingley. Isabella Damas Venuki. <laughs> Martin Tucker Wilson. So it's my distinct honor to again congratulate all of you, these graduates of the Graham School, Master of Liberal Arts, Master of Science, and Master of Arts in Teaching. Again, congratulations. It is now my distinct honor and privilege to introduce our featured speaker, Ian Solomon. Ian has led the University of Chicago's Global Engagement Office since 2013. With colleagues in Chicago, Beijing, New Delhi, Hong Kong, and the world over, the Global Engagement Team has supported international programs and partnerships, overseas centers and campuses, research collaborations, and innovative global education opportunities. Ian came to Chicago from President Obama's administration, in which he served as executive director for the World Bank Group from 2010 to 2013, and represented the United States in multilateral diplomacy and multi-stakeholder agreements. Prior to that, Ian worked as senior advisor to Treasury Secretary Timothy Geithner and as legislative counsel to then Senator Barack Obama. He has also been associate dean at Yale Law School and a consultant with McKinsey. Ian is moving on from his position at the University of Chicago at the end of this academic year to paint his own canvas and become CEO of Solomon Global, a business devoted to building capacity for negotiation, collaboration, and cooperation in complex situations around the world. Solomon Global offers unique learning experiences and strategic advisory and facilitation services to individuals, organizations, and partnerships worldwide. Ian is originally from New York City. 
He earned his, BA, his AB, magna cum laude, from Harvard University, and his JD from Yale. He has traveled extensively in Africa, Asia, Europe, and Latin America, and has also lived in South Africa. He is the recipient of numerous awards and designations, and in 2012 was selected as a young global leader by the World Economic Forum. He resides in Chicago and Washington, D.C. with his wonderful wife and two sons. And on a personal note, I have to say, having been recruited here as dean two years ago, it was Ian's vision, Ian's leadership, and his friendship that helped convince me to make this journey, and I'm forever grateful for him. And when, as dean, one gets the opportunity to ask someone to address our graduates, I couldn't think of a better person to share his thoughts. So let me introduce Ian Solomon. move this if it's okay. Thank you, Dean Nemec. You make me sound so serious. But I love the energy in this room. It's fantastic. It really is an honor to be here with the Graham School for the 527th Convocation of the University of Chicago. It has been a privilege to witness the creative vitality of the Graham School, which has been an essential thread of the university fabric since the very beginning. So congratulations, graduates. You look great. I'm excited for you. And you've worked hard to be here today. We've really made you sweat, though mostly metaphorically before today. Um, but I hope you can bask or at least soak in the well-deserved glory with your loved ones, and I have no doubt you will. Um, we are proud of you and proud to welcome you to a wonderful community of alumni and friends. Embrace this community, and I hope it will enrich your lives intellectually, socially, professionally, spiritually, and unexpectedly for decades to come. I'm happy for all of you, and I'm happy for myself that we get to be here in this very special hall named for the legendary photographer Gordon Parks, one of my creative heroes. Today, I want to tell you about another hero of mine. About two years ago, my mother, an artist and a K-12 teacher, started to teach me to paint. It was not my first painting lesson, but the first in about 30 years. We'd sit on the beach near her home in Florida and secure a canvas to the easel so it would not blow away, or we'd sit in her backyard under the tall trees and by the dense woods and I'd recognize the familiarity of her short, stubby fingers squeezing paint from colored tubes onto clean palette paper pinned to a garden table with little stones. And she would tell me to look at what I wanted to draw, to look carefully, to really see it, to look beyond what I believed the objects were supposed to look like, and rather to see the sand or the trees or the bushes as they actually were, to see the shape and contour, the darks and lights, the depth and texture, the true reality. She taught me how to frame out my subject using my hands so that I could focus on the composition that I wanted to draw, or, or to reframe the scene if that worked better, notice what is in, what is out of the frame. And then she'd ask me to sketch what I saw. The first line is always the most difficult. Making the, marking the blank canvas puts you suddenly in charge of the outcome. I now owned the painting. It was my responsibility. After I'd painted for a short while, she'd remind me to take a couple of steps back from the canvas, to observe the picture from a greater distance, to reflect on how the parts make up the whole, and to gain perspective on the way the micro detail when I'm painting up close did or did not matter as I'd step away to the overall expression of the piece. My mom would encourage me to experiment, to use the edge of a knife or even a shell rather than a brush. Sometimes she would mix sand into the paint to change the texture and add more depth and dimension to her own paintings. If I had a question about technique, she'd say, watch me, let me help you. And she'd take my brush and demonstrate, now you try it, she'd say. One of her tricks was rotating the canvas on its side, or even upside down, 
so we could observe it from a new perspective, challenge our assumptions, be pushed to see images in a fresh way. My mom didn't mind that a painting resemble, didn't demand that a painting resemble the subject being painted. The emotional content mattered more. Paint what you feel, she would tell me. And I was encouraged by her to find new ideas on the canvas itself. I see a face here, she might say, as if identifying forms in a passing cloud. What do you see? She celebrated any invitation to be more imaginative and more creative. I don't recall her seeing anything on a canvas that she considered a mistake. Whatever was there was just something to be worked with. Once, I remember, I became extremely frustrated trying to represent in my painting the delicate lips on the figure of a small cracked statue that she had in her backyard. The mouth on my canvas had become a muddy mess, too dark, too heavy, too wet, with paint to work with. Take a break, she said. Let the paint dry and then come back to it. If you need to, you can always repaint it white and start over. In fact, through the years, she would revisit some of her own paintings long after they were finished and discover new ideas and inspiration. She might paint over a section, largely burying what had existed there undisturbed for years with new colors and new forms, bringing out new meaning and possibility. What is ever finished, she'd ask. My mom, Linda, or Mrs. Solomon to her students, was ill for more than two years. I visited her on many weekends, and we'd talk and draw and paint. And when she was able, we would take long walks along the beach. She'd once loved to dance while she painted, like Mr. Oliver. Painting <laughs> was a form of dance to her. But as her body declined, she danced less and less. And more and more, she had to sit and wait for a canvas to be brought to her. Painting for her was a metaphor for life. Be the artist of your life, she would say. All life can be art. Work with what you've got. I recall one day when we were setting up in her studio, getting ready to start painting. I unfolded the easel. I pulled out a clean sheet of palette paper. I assembled my paints and the water and the blotter cloth and the brushes. I picked out a canvas to use, I grabbed some charcoal, had to go wash my hands, decided to get a snack, decided to stay at the canvas some more. Get started already, she said. Enough with the setup. And this may have been one of her greatest lessons. Take action. Get started. Enough with the setup. This was just a few weeks before she died, about three months ago. She had been battling ovarian cancer, and the cancer finally won. No more walks on the beach, no more dancing, no more life lessons through painting. Before she died, she told me that she hoped I would keep painting and that my kids would paint too. Let life be your teacher. There is beauty all around us. Never stop learning and paint your own canvas. So I've been reflecting on her advice. Each time I grab the phone because I want to tell her something or want to share a photo of her grandson playing piano or graduating from the middle school at lab, like my son Miles did this past Tuesday, I miss her. Work with what you got. Never stop learning. Paint your own canvas. I still hear her voice loving me, encouraging me. And there is an idea that I have been harboring for a very long time, mixing its paint colors perhaps in my mind, but just in my mind. It was an idea that lodged itself in my consciousness many years ago and has refused to leave. Perhaps the idea was born in Johannesburg, South Africa in 1993, when I was there to witness the end of apartheid, achieved finally through a negotiated agreement to hold the country's first democratic election. Or perhaps the idea was born earlier, the, earlier when a movie called The Day After portrayed the consequences of nuclear war with the Soviet Union. Maybe the idea was seeded even earlier than that when my mom and dad introduced me to the stories of Martin Luther King Jr. or Mohandas Gandhi. 
Or maybe when I first learned the story of my namesake, the very wise King Solomon, who threatened to split a baby in half in order to resolve a dispute over who was the rightful parent. The idea is that we can improve the quality and quantity of cooperation. How do we as a species learn to coexist without annihilating ourselves and destroying our planet? From climate change to pandemic disease to nuclear proliferation to terrorism and all the threats you may have studied in your program on threat response and management, the greatest problems we face are challenges of cooperation. They can only be solved by improving cooperation. Imagine, if you will, a world where more people have the tools to negotiate nonviolent solutions to problems. Imagine if our habitual responses could be based on finding common ground and collaborating even with people who are different from us. Imagine if we were to achieve the same pace of innovation for cooperation as we do for communication, computation, transportation, and war. Can you imagine? We just might save the lives of a few teenagers killed violently each weekend in Chicago or Rio or Johannesburg. We just might spare a few thousand people in Aleppo, Kabul, or northern Mali the trauma of war and dislocation. We just might inch closer to an international agreement to really protect this precious earth from the ravages of our modern lives. This is my canvas. This is my challenge to advance the art and science of cooperation, to build the capacity of peace builders and catalysts of cooperation, to create transformative learning experiences that help people work together to resolve disputes at home, at work, and everywhere, to develop tools that foster collaboration and enable the social whole to be greater than the sum of our individual parts. And I believe this is very much your challenge, too. Whether you, your work involves threat response, analytics, teaching, liberal arts. And the instrument of cooperation is negotiation. Negotiation is the means by which we navigate through a world of diverse interests. Not only when we sit on opposite sides of a table talking about a contract, but each and every day. Negotiation is the discussion with a spouse about where to go to dinner, with a colleague about which food truck to go to, or the debate with a child about bedtime because mom or dad has to study, or the moment in traffic when you want to change lanes. Whenever we seek the cooperation of another, we are negotiating, and often we're hoping to lower the costs or increase the benefits of that cooperation. Negotiation is a skill that improves with mindful practice, and like the art, of painting, it is something we can learn and get better at over time. In fact, I like to apply some of my mom's painting lessons to negotiation, and I hope that these might be helpful to you too. First, the importance of seeing what's really there, and not, really, not merely what you imagine should be the situation based on your preconceived expectations or biases. Working hard to understand the issues actually in front of you and what's driving your interests and the other party's interests. Use all the tools at your disposal from observation to data analytics to intuition. Second is the value in being able to frame and potentially reframe issues that are in contention. Does it help to include more items within the frame or to exclude certain features? Seek a manageable set of items to handle, like in the painting, and make sure you're focusing on the issues in context. Third, recognize how useful it can be to step back from the negotiation, take a few steps back periodically, and take in the big picture with a more diffuse lens. One of my great negotiation mentors, William Urey, has suggested that we should metaphorically go to the balcony so that we can observe the unfolding negotiation with greater detachment and distance. We also need to be willing to take a break and let the paint dry. Rather than continuing to fish in the mud for good solutions, sometimes we need to be willing to walk away. 
The fourth lesson is the insight that we should occasionally turn a dispute on its side or flip it upside down so it can be analyzed from a new perspective. We need the courage to find new ways of seeing old problems. And the fifth lesson, we should experiment with new tools or approaches. Let's mix some sand with paint. Accept and reciprocate invitations to be creative. The best solutions will satisfy all parties in more ways than they had expected. I think we also need, and this is lesson six, to be willing to continue to improve things after we think they're finished. Once an agreement has been reached, can we go back to make it better for all parties involved? Go back to the proverbial table, back to the canvas. Was it ever finished anyway? Make it better. Seven, life can be our teacher. We all negotiate every single day. We have numerous opportunities to study behavior and response, to try out different approaches, both for our own benefit and for mutual benefit. We can collect the data on our lives and the interactions and reflect upon them, study our own thoughts and our feelings, study our actions and their results, and with empathy, we can understand the same for others. Let's be students of negotiation who never stop learning. As our teaching graduates today here know, the most important skill is learning how to learn. Number eight is to remember the importance of emotion. If you really want to change someone's mind or their behavior, if you want to motivate them or impact their lives, you have to reach them at an emotional level. You have to tell stories and capture images that they can grasp at the level of their humanity and vulnerability. And finally, ask for help. Sometimes you should let someone else handle the negotiation for you or show you the way. In fact, you are surrounded in this room today by many people who can be your allies, your advocates, your assistants, your advisors, your agents in negotiation. They can be your teachers. They may also include some of your heroes. Pay attention to them while you can. Appreciate them and thank them. They support you and want to help just like my mom always wanted to help me. But for me, and maybe also for you, there's at least one more lesson. It is often through tragedy or failure that we find our voice, grab hold of our paintbrush, and discover our power. Great achievements are born from failure. They rise from the ashes like the symbolic phoenix on the UChicago logo. An event that may appear to be a tragedy or a mistake is in the end just something to be worked with. My mom's passing and then cleaning up her art supplies forced me to confront an important question. What have I been waiting for? What are you waiting for? Enough with the setup. Don't wait for a tragic loss. It's time to paint your own canvas. Each of you here is blessed with the sacred opportunity to be the artist of your own life, to sketch out an authentic future, even if it's intimidating to begin and you don't know where you might end up. The diverse journeys that brought you here today show your commitment to lifelong learning. Join me in committing also to long life learning. Let life be our teacher. Find the lessons every day in every experience, positive or negative. Be grateful for the opportunity to learn even from tragedy and failure, even as we soak in the joy of today's celebration. Today we mark an important accomplishment and congratulate you for your achievement. But in that same breath, I want to remind you that your canvas is ready for you. Your masterpiece is waiting. What are you waiting for? Thank you.
Thank you, Ian. At this time, we'd like to thank our friends and family who have joined you in celebration today and who've supported you during your time in your program. Graduates, please join me in thanking your friends and family. We now invite our graduates and guests to a reception located in the atrium just outside of this auditorium. Guests, please remain in your seats until after our platform party and graduates have left the hall.